What an honor to be invited to the marriage of the Lamb, to come and worship Him. Celebration. It's the joining of the bride and the sun, the two becoming one. All the prophecies fulfilled in a moment, so we sing like the Give him glory. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for bringing us into the presence of God through worship this morning. We're so grateful for those, all who serve and all those who've connected. Now, I want to give a special welcome to those that are connecting in on uh, online, Facebook, or uh, YouTube. But I got to tell you, you're going to miss something today because this is a highly interactive, I think we're going to involve all of the senses this morning, taste, touch, hearing, the whole nine yards. So if you are connecting in online, get on over here because this is the place to be. Um, again, we are welcoming uh, Dr. Michael Hertz to our service. He is a, a Messianic rabbi with Chosen People Ministries, and uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about him a little bit later on in the service. But just as a matter of protocol, let me encourage you, we're encouraging all of our families to sit together as, most, as, as much as you can. The preschool and the toddler room are going to be open as usual. But we want the older kids to be a part of this because I think it'll be interactive enough that it'll hold everybody's attention. So it'll be an experience that you'll definitely want to be together for. So that's going to be starting in just a couple minutes. Um, first time visitors, there's a welcome table right in the back. It's got the big balloons there and it's got something for you on it as well. If you are here for the first time, we are so glad that you're here. We want to welcome you and send you home with uh, something uh, encouraging. Grab that on the back table, there'll be somebody standing there at the end of the service to greet you as well. Um, also, connect cards. Yeah, they're not in the, in, the, in the chair in front of you, they're in your chair behind you. So you can grab one of those cards, fill out any prayer requests that you might have, any change of address, any things that we need to know about. You put that in the uh, one of the buckets as we pass those. Also put them in one of the boxes in the back. We'll make sure we get you connected. A lot of stuff going on this week. This is Holy Week. As you may have figured it out, this is the day we celebrate what? Palm Sunday, right? So we've got our palms. We've got our hosannas that we're going to be singing to the Lord. But it is the launch of the week that we connect with the person of Christ on a real-time basis, walking with Jesus during this entire week. And so there's going to be something going on uh, this week that you're going to need to know about. Number one, Good Friday's coming up, and it is going to be, yes, this Friday, right here from 6 to 8. No, it's not going to be a two-hour service. You come anytime between 6 and 8. We're going to walk you through six of the stations of the cross to really highlight the sacrifice that Christ has made so that we might have fellowship with God through him. So that's going to be a kind of a solemn procession, but I really feel it's going to give you an idea of the weight and the significance of what Good Friday is all about. Now, Saturday is going to be kind of a community event. This is where we spread the good news of our risen Christ to the community. We're going to have a special event here from 1 to 3 o'clock. It's going to include an Easter egg hunt. We're going to have bounce houses. If you want to be a part of uh, helping with that, we need hard candies delivered and uh, by the 27th of March. So make sure that those get in here as well. And that's going to be on Saturday. Now, Sunday morning, of course, is Easter Sunday. If you are up at 6.16 or 7.16 in the morning, you're welcome to join uh, us for our Easter sunrise service at Lake Kane. It is a, uh, a Easter sunrise service, pancake breakfast, and yes, it is a lake swim. So if you are not, you don't have to swim if you don't come, but if you do, dress appropriately. If old guys and speedos is not your thing, this is not your event, okay? But this is where, where it's one of the most unusual uh, Easter sunrise service in Central Florida. I want to invite you to be a part of that. And then right here, um, our normal time, 1030 on Sunday morning, we're going to have two baptisms on Easter Sunday. How cool it is to be baptized on Easter Sunday. That's going to happen right here. Absolutely. Now, also, we're going to receive the offering as part of our worship a little bit later in the service, and we are also going to take a special offering to uh, Dr. Hertz and the Chosen People Ministries, and we just encourage you to continue to give abundantly, not only your tithes and your offerings for Westwood Church, but then over and above giving to the Chosen People Ministries, who have a, a wonderful ministry to the Jewish people here in this community and really around the world. Um, also, if you're interested in finding out more about the ministry, there's a book table in the uh, foyer. You probably saw it when you came in. All kinds of information there and books that uh, will direct you to what that ministry is all about. Check that out after the service is over. Well, 
You certainly did not come here to hear me give announcements, so let us get right into the worship of our living God who promises his presence with his people. Amen? Amen. If you'd like to stand to worship with us this morning, you can go ahead and do that. Lord, we want to come and approach your throne this morning knowing that you have provided this table for us through your son, Jesus Christ, that we could commune together as a Christian body but mostly we get to commune with you. So, Lord, we want to honor you this morning with our worship. Would you come and meet with us this morning? Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place to reveal whatever it is you want to reveal to each one of us through this time together and through our worship, through the teaching, through the elements. God, we lift you high this morning. Let's worship. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt.
If faith can move mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you.
We're singing And as you sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. We've been singing and lifting praise and quieting our hearts to celebrate this week. And this is a great prep for making our hearts ready in song and now in word. So let's join our hearts together and let's pray. Father in heaven, we've come together here to join our hearts before you. And we say, first and foremost, you are the only presence that is holy. We declare in our joining hearts right now that you are God above all gods, the one, the one who created us, who imagined and formed the universe that is around us. And it all was made to give you glory, to reflect you, to worship you as holy. And Lord, this is a special day today, one in which we will be celebrating the Passover, the Lord's Supper, and see the richness of symbolism that is part of remembering your faithfulness to all your people. It is all about you. We have the distinct pers perspective of being able to look back and see how so long ago people were tearing up. tearing off branches from trees and hailing you as the king and yet would within days be yelling crucify. It's hard to imagine it. And yet, Lord, we are guilty of the very same thing. One minute we're tearing off branches from trees and exalt and worship you for who you are and the next moment we betray forget who you are and some of us may have come in here a little discouraged today confused tired of the voices that wear us down the chaos that becomes a cacophony of things that pull us away from intimacy and awareness of your presence and Lord we do not want to listen to those voices so we're here today to reaffirm that we want to trust you in all circumstances. We affirm that we trust you with all our hearts, that when we're weary and everything seems to be going wrong, we can still utter these four words, I trust you, Jesus. And by doing this, we release the control into your hands and your heart for us, and we fall back into the security of your own always powerfully their arms teach us to more and more rest in your presence and to look for and see it expectantly and be able to distinguish between what's important and what is not we long for your perspective and then not hesitate to receive joy from you because that you give abundantly so lord teach us to take many breaks from the chaos that pulls finding places to be still in your presence and listen to your voice. There's always immense treasure to be found there. So we ask, knowing you will give to us. We seek, knowing you, we will find. We knock, knowing you will open doors. Thank you, Father, for what you see, you, we see you doing among this body, the answers to prayer. Thank you for bringing David out. Thank you for healing touches. Thank you for safe journeys, for choices that heal relationships. And we pray for Seth and his upcoming hearing and ask your healing touch for Grace and Beverly, Frank and Morris, Mike and Flora, Mary, Nellie in her recovery, and any others needing your touch. We ask for safe returns of those who are on the road and in the air, and we most deeply ask you to do what only you and your spirit can do to heal the brokenness among us, relationships that need courageous changes of heart, and we trust them to you alone. 
So we thank you for the amazing gift of your spirit and rejoice in you this day with palm branches and very grateful hearts. You have done great things and keep doing them until you return to take us home. We love you, Lord. We proclaim and ask and say these things in the precious name of our Jesus. Amen. This is also a time where we can worship by giving your tithes and offerings. Um, every table has a bucket near it, if you wouldn't <clears throat> mind finding that and passing it. And as you do, then let's say their giving statement together. Because God has entrusted his resources of time, talent, and treasure into our care, we choose to return our gifts to him as an act of worship. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm the pastor here, and I want to welcome you uh, for joining us on Palm Sunday, a special day, and a special welcome and shalom to the Messianic rabbi, uh, Rabbi Mike Hertz. Let me tell you a little bit about Mike, and then we're going to see a video of the Chosen Sorry. People Ministry. After the video is done, it's just a four-minute video, we are going to take another offering. And so let me explain this. Uh, our regular offering is to cover the needs of the church. And thank you for being so generous. Last Sunday was another amazing Sunday of giving. Uh, so we would ask that you give uh, regularly to the church. But the Messianic rabbi is a missionary with Chosen People Ministry, which means he has to raise his own support. So the gifts that we will give after the video will go directly to him. If you have a check, you can write in the line there, Chosen People Ministry, and he can then uh, put that towards his account uh, with that mission. So we would encourage you to give. Now let me tell you about Mike and uh, his dear wife, uh, who's quite an accomplished person. She was in the U.S. Air Force and uh, got to become a colonel, full colonel in the Air Force. Uh, she is now retired, but uh, they have been together, and Mike has been serving as a clinical psychologist in some of the Air Force bases around the country. And then most recently, in 2005, he was ordained, and 2010, he became a missionary with the Chosen People Ministries. Um, Mike grew up in Long Island, New York. And he went to Stony Brook High School, I believe it was. Uh, he heard about Jesus, but uh, a lot of Christians weren't too kind to uh, high school Jewish kids. Uh, some of them would accuse them of killing their Savior. And so Mike kind of had an adverse reaction to some of the comments that were given him uh, growing up. He was bar mitzvahed at uh, age 13, uh, grew up in a a conservative Orthodox uh, synagogue, and uh, yet before he graduated from high school, he accepted Jesus as his savior. He began to understand what that meant, and some of his family members weren't too happy with that. In fact, uh, I believe his grandmother was the one who thought he had become a Gentile. He wasn't Jewish anymore, but he's been able to explain, no, he's a fulfilled Jew. He's a Jew who has come to know that the Messiah came for all people, and uh, so he'll explain a bit of that. But I, I do mention that uh, he did start a church in Virginia, had a team uh, that were able to start a vibrant church there. He is now living in South Florida, near Miami, and he is the regional director for Chosen People Ministries, uh, and goes around to churches like ours to minister and teach, and also to lead uh, Passover Seder. Now, there are books in the back you can get on your way out. I believe he's going to tell you that if you sign up for his prayer letter, he will give you this book on Isaiah 53 Explained. So I grabbed a copy quickly, and I'm going to sign up uh, for his newsletter. Uh, if there are others that would like to do that, we welcome you to do that. Dr. Hertz, would you come? Uh, I've had enjoyed a yesterday afternoon with you and dinner last night. We welcome you to Westwood. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Well, shalom. shalom. 
what a beautiful worship service that was. Your team is awesome. Just, uh, just love the worship. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Dr. Michael Hurst, also called Mike. And I'm the Southeast United States Regional Director for Chosen People Ministries. And so wonderful to be warmly welcomed. And I'm also a, as the pastor was saying, I'm a, I'm a Messianic Jew. What's a Messianic Jew? I'm glad you asked. It's different than a messy Jew, although my wife might disagree with that. <laughs> a Messianic Jew is a Jew who believes that the Messiah has already come, and his name is Jesus. Perhaps you've read some books by Messianic Jews. If not, I'd like to recommend some books that are written by Jewish believers. I have some on the back table, but the ones I want to recommend are even so much better. Pastor, do you mind if I just recommend some books? For, okay, so some books written by Jewish believers in Jesus that I highly recommend. Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, Gospel of John, all of Paul's letters. Just about every book in the New Testament with a possible exception of Luke and Acts. And they, even that's debatable. So if you don't have a copy of those books, Pastor, you'll give them one for free, won't you? Uh, we, have, we have them right in the back. We well, have them right in the back. Fantastic. But I grew up in a conservative Jewish home. Now, conservative, that's not a political thing. That's actually one of the branches of Judaism. And um, when I was growing up, I, we'd celebrate Passover every year. And growing up, I always thought the main hero of Passover was Moses. And that's true. But it was later on I found out that the real hero of Passover is Jesus. So you may be wondering, Jesus, Passover is Jewish. Well, so is Jesus. And not only did he celebrate Passover every year while he was with us on earth, but I believe he's clearly pictured in the story of Passover and in the symbols of Passover because the message of Passover is the promise of redemption. And the story of Passover is the story of our liberation from bondage. So this morning as we celebrate and, and we have the tastes and touch and smells, sounds of, of, uh, that are included in a traditional Passover Seder, I hope that you'll view it as not just an ancient Jewish commemorative meal. I hope that you'll come to view it as I view it, as an object lesson in the life and mission of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look closely because in this you will see his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return. If you have a Bible, if not, not, it'll be on the screen, Exodus chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, then 11 through 15. But before we read that passage, uh, I want to open up in prayer and give you a little bit of background. When I pray, I'm going to say a little bit of Hebrew, then I'll do the English translation. If you're not used to Hebrew, you should get used to it, because you'll hear a lot in heaven. Avinu <laughs> Malkenu, our Father, our King. Todah Rabbah Adonainu. Thank you greatly, O Lord. Ata Melechama King. You are King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the one who loved us so much that while we were dead in our trespasses and sin, you made us alive. You paid the penalty that we owed. And you gave us your life and eternity with you. Only by receiving you, accepting you as the Lord of our life, as our Savior, as our Messiah. We pray this morning that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts could be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. And we pray this by Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Before I read the passage, I want to give you a little bit of background. My people, we found ourselves enslaved in Egypt. We were enslaved in a nation that considered infanticide against us as a matter of national policy. Finally, we, we crawled out to God, and God sent a deliverer. His name was Moses. No, it was not Charleston Heston. Uh, but, and actually, that reminds me of the story of these two goats. See, there's these two goats, and they're in a landfill. And one of the goats is eating a DVD. So the goat sees his friend eating the DVD and asks a logical question. So, how's the movie? And the goat responds, eh, the book was better. <laughs> the book is always better, amen? The book is always better. So God tells Moses to, take, to go across the desert and tell Aaron, the, I mean, tell um, Pharaoh, the ruler of all Egypt, to let people go. So after some hesitation, Moses goes, he brings Aaron with, Aaron, his brother, with him, and he goes and goes across to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, he tells Pharaoh, God says to let my people go. 
And uh, Pharaoh says, I don't know that God way over there. We have all the gods we need right here in Egypt. So no, I'm not going to let your people go. So one by one through the plagues, God, the only God, the real God, the living God, showed his superiority over all the false Egyptian gods until we get to where the story picks up, where God says, in effect, this is the 10th plague, I'm going to redeem you through the blood and body of innocent, dead little lamps. And he gives specific instructions. But don't forget, each one of those plagues was a direct attack on the false Egyptian gods. There's only one God, and it's he who we serve. So Exodus chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, and then 11 through 15. If you're having trouble Exodus chap- finding Exodus chapter, 12, uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, I want to encourage you to Exodus chapter 12, verse 4. It's right after that. <laughs> and you have it up on your screen as well. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to slaughter it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night with roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. Let's skip down to verse 11. Now you shall eat it in this way, with your garment belted around your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand, and you shall eat in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and fatally strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the human firstborn to animals, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. By the way, notice where it says all the gods of Egypt. That's a small g. There's only one true and living God. Verse 13. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will come upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day shall be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove dough with yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Just as the church spends their time preparing their hearts and their homes for Christmas and Easter, the Jewish community spends time preparing their hearts and their homes for Passover and the high holy days which come in the fall. And that's why in some Orthodox Jewish homes today, for six weeks prior to Passover, the house undergoes a complete spring cleaning. We remove all the cakes, the cookies, the cereals, the bread. It's a tough time. (laughs) And, And you may be wondering, why are we removing all everything that contains any leaven or yeast, as the Scripture said? Well, throughout Scripture, leaven is frequently, not always, but frequently used as a symbol of sin. It only takes a small portion of leaven to ferment an entire batch of dough. It's the leaven that causes the dough to rise to become puffed up. Like sin causes us to become puffed up in our own eyes. And if there's bakers here, you know that if you leave that yeast or or leavening in dough for too long, you leave it unchecked, it makes it kind of nasty. If we let sin reign in our lives unchecked, it makes us kind of nasty. So we move all the Everything that contains any leaven or yeast as a way of saying, we want to break that cycle of sin in our lives. We want to live a sinless and holy life before God. And this is usually the work of the woman of the house, is traditionally who does all the cleaning. But according to Jewish tradition, ceremonial preparation as well as prayer is usually the primary responsibility of the male of the house. And that's probably why in Luke chapter 22, Jesus sends two men to prepare the Passover. So if you think about it, maybe the man should be doing those cleaning, doing those six. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's got to be a loophole here somewhere. I remember. Yes, our rabbis have come up with a terrific solution to the problem. Yes, it's true. The woman has been doing all the cleaning and working real hard, removing every speck of leaven or yeast. Well, almost every speck. 
She's, she's taken a bit of leaven, maybe it crumbs from the morning's toast, and she's hidden it somewhere in the house, and it's up to the man to find it. So right before Passover, he might come home, and he'll set down his briefcase, maybe, and he'll pick up some rather strange-looking cleaning tools. He'll pick up a napkin, a wooden spoon, and a feather, and he'll go on what we call Bedikat Chames, the search for the leaven. Let's try saying that together, ready? Bedikat very good. Chametz. Very good. Now apologize to the person in front of you. You just spat on the back of their neck. <laughs> and so what he'll do is he'll light the candle. All the children will follow behind. And where could that leaven be? Maybe it's in the dining room. No, no. Maybe in the living room. No, he'll be searching the entire house from top to bottom just to find those few crumbs. But if he's lucky, she's put it the same place she's put it last year and the year before that and the year before that. So finally, the husband discovers the crumbs. And when he discovers the crumbs, he takes the feather and he carefully wipes the crumbs onto the wooden spoon. Ladies, for me, this is heavy housekeeping. <laughs> and since 11 represents what? Sin. That's right. He's not permitted to touch it. So instead, they'll take the napkin. And now they just throw it in the trash outside, but... In ancient times, they'd go down the courtyard of the synagogue where the men have, men have gathered, and he'd take that bundle of leaven along with a feather and the wooden spoon and the napkin, and he'd toss it into the flames. Then he'd come home and proudly proclaim, now I have cleansed my house of all leaven. <laughs> but just to be certain, he'll add, may all manner of leaven, which I have neither seen or not seen, be declared null and void as the dust of the earth. Amen. The house has been cleansed. The home is now ready for the Passover. And during the Passover, the head of the household wears a white robe called a kittle. In Jewish tradition, white is a symbol of purity or holiness. And this white, reminds, this white robe reminds us of the robes that the priests used to use when they used to minister around the temple. Hoping my collar is straight. And so it is good. And then he'll uh, take the roll. They didn't have snaps back then, but we have them now. And then, but they, what they did have back then is a string to tie the rope together. I'm not sure why, but every year the string seems to get shorter and shorter. I'm not quite sure why. And you've seen Jewish men wear a covering on their head as a sign of respect before God. And that's called a yarmulke or kippah. But on Passover, a special yarmulke could be worn, a yarmulke could be worn like this one with nice, embroider, nice embroidery on it. Or what I like to wear is a mitre. Just like this. And so what we have is priestly robes and the symbol of a crown. Because on Passover, the head of the household is functioning in the role of a priest and as a king. And as a king, he guides his family through the Passover Seder. Seder is a Hebrew word which means order, and that's because the Passover celebration follows a specific order of service, and that order is found here in the Haggadah. Let's try saying that together. Ready? Haggadah. Very good. If you're in Israel, you'll probably say Haggadah, but we're in America, so we can say Haggadah, and that means the telling. Well, Passover, and the, tell, the Haggadah is a guidebook through the Seder. It kind of walks you through the Passover Seder. Well, the Passover celebration begins with the lighting of the candles, and this is usually the duty and the honor of the woman of the house. As a Jewish believer in Jesus, I think it's fitting that a woman lights the candles, because it reminds me that the Messiah the light of the world was brought into the world, not through the seed of a man, but through the seed of a woman. As the prophet Isaiah foretold, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which means what? Isn't that amazing? His name will be called God with us. And later on, the prophet Isaiah says, A light to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So at each table, we need, ceremonially speaking, a mama and a papa, a mother and a father for each table. And what I'm going to ask the designated mama to do 
is to grab the candles and put them in front of you, just like that, and grab the matches. And I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to show you how it's done. Don't, don't light them yet. I'm going to show you how it's done. And then I'm going to walk you through it slowly. Okay? All right, yeah. And, and just so you know, another reason, I just want to clarify something. Another reason that a woman lights the candles has nothing to do with not wanting to trust men with matches. I just want to, <laughs> that's not the reason, just, just in case you're wondering. So I'm going to show you how it's done, and then I'm going to walk you through it. So don't light them just yet. So the woman will light the candles. Is that going to go? I hope so. Feel the warmth of the flame three times. And they say, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. I'll walk you through it. Asher Kedishanu BeMitzvohotav, Vetzivanu LeHalik Ner Shel Pesach. Amen. So with the mom at the table, oh, that means blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sets us apart by his commandments, and has commanded us to kindle the Passover lights. I know you knew the translation, but I thought I'd tell you anyway. So go ahead, if, if the woman, if, if you're able to stand, please stand up in front of the candles. And then, uh, and then the, the mama of the table will light the candles. And after she... I'm going to wait till the candles are all lit. We're having a little trouble. We'll get there. All right, we're working on it. <laughs> All right. Excellent. And the woman could just feel the warmth of the flame three times. And then repeat after me. Baruch And, and just, just the mamas, we want to hear their voices. Adonai. Eloheinu, Melech Haolam, Asher Kiddushanu, Bemitzvotav, Vetsivanu, Lehadlik Ner. Shel Pesach. And everybody together. Amen. Wow, didn't they sound great? They sound absolutely beautiful. Wow. And the woman can have a seat. Um, God is a master teacher. And he uses the Jewish holidays to teach us about his redemptive plan. Every biblical Jewish holiday points to the Messiah. Every one of them. And through the Passover, he designed a ceremony with sights and smell and taste and touch and sound. It draws in all of our senses. It brings to life his message of redemption. And a traditional Passover Seder is, a quick and, is not a quick and passing event. A traditional Passover Seder could take up to four hours. So make yourselves comfortable. We won't take quite that long. But over the course of the four hours, each adult will take and drink from his cup four times. I have four cups here for demonstration purposes, but it's one cup and you have a cup in front of you that's refilled four times. And each cup has a special meaning and we give them lots of different names because these ceremonies are, are thousands of years old. The first cup is, and by the way, they also match the four I wills in Exodus chapter six. The first cup is the Kiddush cup or the cup of sanctification, I will bring you out. 
And the second cup, the cup of deliverance or the cup of plagues. I will deliver you. Now this third cup is the focal point of the entire evening. This is the cup taken after dinner. This is the cup of redemption. And the fourth cup, the cup of halal, or the cup of praise. I will take you to be my people. The third cup, I will redeem you. The fourth cup, I will take you to be my people. It's with this first cup that the host offers thanks to God Almighty, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. Will the papas at the table please stand? The designated father for each table. And holding this cup aloft, grab that cup, hold it aloft. You can put your hand over it like this. And just, just like the women repeated after me, uh, the men can repeat after me. Is that all right? All right. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melchor Olam Bohorei Peri Hagafen Amen. Go ahead, guys. Oh, was that too fast? Oh, I can slow it down for him. All right, I'll, I'll slow it down a little bit. And just the men will sing this. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Bohorei Peri Hagafen Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. And go ahead and take a sip of it. After the cup of blessing, and, and everybody take a sip of the first cup. Everybody go ahead and take a sip. After the cup of blessing, and, and the papas at the table can go ahead and sit down. The, after the cup of bless, blessing, the cup of sanctification is partaken of. We have the ceremonial washing of hands. In the days when the temple was standing, it was tradition that hands must be washed before dipping any food into any liquid. And this was seen as a part of the process of purification. Animal sacrifices was also used because it was acknowledged that no amount of water can truly cleanse us from our sin. We know from Leviticus 17.11, we know from Hebrews 19.22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It might have been, we don't know for sure, but it might have been at this point in the Seder that Jesus washed not only his hands, but the feet of his disciples. We know from the way that they were sitting that Judas would have been placed in the seat of honor. So it was Judas' feet he would have washed first. I think Jesus was demonstrating that humiliation often comes before exaltation. And we don't have the, uh, the cups at every table, but basically what they would do is just take a little bit of water and pour it over each hand. and dry them. The service has begun. Now that the service has begun, the youngest person of the family comes forward and asks her traditional four questions. I was the youngest in my family, so this was my job. And they're cantillated, and the introduction to the questions goes like this. Which means, why is this night different than any other night? Or the more newer translations of the Haggadah say, Dad, what's with all this stuff? <laughs> well, those of us who know the meaning of Passover are obligated to respond. In our response, we tell the story of Passover. We tell the story of our redemption from Egypt. And in doing so, we say, this is because of what the Lord did for me when he brought me out of the land of Egypt, when he brought me out of bondage and slavery to Pharaoh, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. See, Passover imparts more than God's message of redemption. It imparts God's means of redemption through the sacrifice of a Passover lamb. Oops, do we have a sound? Were you able to hear me before? Yes. Okay, all right. So I, I can start from the beginning. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My ancestors, there we go. My ancestors were instructed to take a spotless lamb 
to roast it whole without breaking any of its bones, and to apply the blood of that lamb, as we read in this scripture, to the doorpost of their house, to the lintel, the top of the doorpost, and even to the two side posts. And historians tell us there's a basin on their ground that it would drip from the top of the lintel into, into the basin that was on the ground at the foot of the doorpost. And because of their obedience to God's command, and because of their faith in the effectiveness of his provision, they were spared the horrors of that tenth plague that came upon the land of Egypt. For when God passed through the land of Egypt on that night, he also passed through the area of Goshen where the slave nation of Israel was. And when God saw the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes, God forced death to pass over. What a mighty act of redemption. Amen? That's where we get the name Passover from. But what a picture of an even greater redemption through the sacrifice of another Passover lamb, the Messiah Jesus. For just as none of the bones of that first lamb were broken, none of Jesus' bones were broken upon his death. Just as that first lamb was taken into the homes and examined for three and a half days and found spotless, so Jesus, during his earthly ministry, was examined for about three and a half years and found spotless without sin. And just as my ancestors had to take the blood of that lamb and apply it to the doorposts of their homes, so each one of us must apply the blood of the Messiah to the doorposts of our hearts. I'm not, you know, there's one thing God doesn't have. You know what that is? Grandchildren. He only has children, and we must each apply that blood of the Lamb to the doorpost of our hearts. I'm not so sure it's just a coincidence that the way that blood was applied was applied to the lintel, the top of the doorpost, and it was pooled on the ground, and also to the two side posts. When it was applied that way, it matched perfectly the wounds of our Messiah Jesus. The child asked a question. I know, hard to believe children ask questions, but trust me, take my word for it, they do. Actually, I think it's wonderful when children ask questions. On this night, why do we eat only unleavened bread? Now, it's a good question. If ever you tried matzo, I'm talking about not the flavored kind, but the kind like, like this, the kind that you use for Passover. And some people like it, but for me, I'm not sure which tastes better, the matzo or the box it comes in. And so can you see the kid asking, on this night, why do we eat only unleavened bread? You know, we're being occupied by the Romans. There's some Italian bread, our neighbors down the street, you know. <laughs> well, we explain it like this. Our ancestors, in their haste to leave Egypt, had to take the bread with them while it was still flat. Well, one of the items found on a traditional Passover table is this one called the matzah tash. Tash simply means pouch. It's a pouch of matzah. And in the matzah tash, are three la layers of unleavened bread, matzah. Each one of these layers are separated by some cloth. And during the Passover Seder, the head of the household removes the middle layer. Go ahead. Who's uh, the papas of the house? Do you have a matzah tosh on the table somewhere? I believe you do. Is the thing with the three napkin, uh, the, the napkins with the three pieces of matzah? And during the Passover Seder, the head of the household, go ahead and remove the middle layer. It becomes visible while the other two remain hidden from view. After he removes the middle layer, he breaks it, puts one half aside, he recites the blessing, Baruch Atah. Let's, let's say everybody do it this time. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth grain from the earth. One of the words that we used for bread in that prayer was lechem, 
which means bread. There's actually a city um, in Israel. Actually, it's right now in occupied territory, but uh, it's called Beit Lechem, which means house of bread. You, and by the way, you know it is Bethlehem. Bethlehem in Hebrew is Beit Lechem, which is house of bread. How amazing is it that the bread of life, that the Messiah was born in the house of bread and then laid in a feeding trough. So what he does after his break, he breaks it, he, he says the blessing, he wraps it in a white cloth. So if there's an extra napkin at your table, go ahead and, and take that extra piece. He wraps it in a white cloth, and then he hides it. It's hidden from view. But it must be found later, or the service cannot continue. Now, I want everybody who is 12 and under to um, look at the back table. I can't see who's back there. Someone back there that's willing to volunteer for something real quick? Micah, Micah, stand up. Micah. Stand up, just for a minute. I, I, I to, all right. I want everyone who's 12 and under to look at Micah because Micah is going to do some funny things. He might make some funny faces. He might just do some funny things. But I want all eyes on Micah right now. All right, thank you, Micah, very much. So what happened is you do the hiding of the Afi Coleman. And it's hidden from view, but it must be found later, or the service cannot continue. All right, the child asks more questions. On this night, why do we eat only bitter herbs, and why do we dip our food twice in very salty water when we normally don't dip it in salty water at all? Well, let me explain by showing you this. This is a Seder plate. And you all have a paper Seder plate in front of you, but despite its appearance with all the indentations, it's not used for deviled eggs. <laughs> a symbolic piece of food from the Passover table is placed into each one of these compartments, and each one of them paints part of the picture of redemption. The first item is carpus, or greens, and usually use parsley or lettuce, and I like to use parsley just like this, because it reminds me of the Aesop that was used to apply the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of the homes. And these greens represent life. But before we eat them, we dip them in very salty water, which reminds us that a life without redemption is a, oh, the salty water represents tears. Thank you. A life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. So I want everyone to take a piece of parsley on your table. If you need some more, let me know. Uh, we have two more cups back there on that speaker if you, if you need that. And dip it in the very salty water. Dip the parsley and taste, taste in effect the tears. Can you taste it? Can you taste the salt? Does anyone need more parsley at their table? Yeah, if it's the regular water, you don't get the full effect. <laughs> and you don't have one of these at your table. I, I just brought it for mine. Uh, this is a chazaret. It's a root of the bitter herb. We usually use an onion or horseradish root, and it reminds us that the very root, life can be bitter as it was for our ancestors in Egypt. But this, ah, uh, this is a maror, freshly ground horseradish. Now, it's tradition, don't do this. Um, it's tradition to eat about, oh, a tablespoon of horseradish. Uh, any volunteers? No, I'm going to ask you not to do that because uh, I don't know that, I, I, I'm new to Orlando, I don't know the number for 911 around here. <laughs> and so, but what I want to ask you to do is just take whatever horseradish you want to, but if you're 12 and under, I'm going to ask you to let your parents decide how much horseradish you take. 
Okay, let, let your parents, if you're 12 and under. But otherwise, uh, you, you decide. Remember, it's powerful stuff. So go ahead and, woo, give it, a, oh, that's good horseradish. Yeah, go ahead and give, give it a taste. Yeah. Whoa, powerful stuff. All right, does, did everyone at the table? Oh, you know what? I forgot to explain. Uh, don't, don't use a spoon. You can use the piece of the matzo that was set aside. Go ahead and break off a little piece of the matzo and, and use the matzo. That's my fault. I forgot to explain. So you got the matzo and the horseradish. Powerful stuff, huh? That's called the maror, the bitter herb itself. And the maror and the chazaret remind us that at the very root, life can be bitter as it was for our ancestors in Egypt. And by way of contrast, we have the charoseth. Now, the charoseth represents the mortar that our ancestors used when they had to make bricks for Pharaoh. Um, it's made up of, there's lots of different recipes. I'm not sure what recipe they sent over, but typically chopped apples and honey and, and nuts, raisins maybe. Uh, and, and so it's really quite delicious. So you may be wondering, why is such a sweet mixture used for such bitter labor, bricks for Pharaoh? Well, our rabbis have a great answer for that as well. They say even the bitterest of labor is made sweetened with the promise of redemption. So by contrast to the horseradish, go ahead and take, take a taste of the haroseth and take a piece of matzah, if you need more matzah, you can use one of the pieces from the uh, matzah tash. You can use one of those if you're running out at your table. Even the bitterest of labors may sweetened with the promise of redemption. Can you taste the contrast? We don't have the time to do this now, but if you want later on, you could do, it's just a tradition called the Hillel Sandwich, supposedly named after Rabbi Hillel. What Rabbi Hillel would do is he'd take a piece of matzah, he'd take some of the horseradish, and then he'd take some of the haroseth, that sweet mixture, and then he'd put a piece of matzah on top of it. And so we'd have like a sandwich, you'd have the sweetness and the bitterness together. So it was called the Hillel Sandwich. No, this is not an Easter egg. The Hebrew word for egg is Beitzah. But at Passover, we could give this egg a special name called the Chagiga. Now, the Chagiga was one of the names given to one of the special temple sacrifices. And so it's a reminder of the sacrifices that were already made. We roast the egg, and that turns it brown. Okay, so we cheated. We started with the brown egg. Do you know how hard it is to roast eggs for all these people? <laughs> that's, that's a task, I'm telling you. So we started with the brown egg. And it's a token of grief to our people. Grief over the destruction of the second temple. Remember, I said it was named after one of the temple sacrifices. And so before we eat it, we peel it. We dip it in very salty water, which represents what? Tears. tears. That's right. But it's not only tears over the destruction of the second temple, but it's not only a token of grief, it's also a symbol of new life. So what I want everyone to do is maybe the head of the uh, table, either the mama or the papa, can peel the egg. And then when you're done peeling it, dip the whole thing into the salty water. Maybe use a spoon for that. And then give a slice to each person at the table. Remember, dip it first, then slice it. Otherwise, the salt water looks pretty nasty. Now, a lot of people find this part of the Passover Seder very appealing. I'm sorry, that was a bad yoke, wasn't it? Uh, hope, hopefully you're cracking up from it. But uh, <laughs> Yes, I am a dad. So I got to get those dad jokes in there. <laughs> so go ahead and peel it in a slice 
a dip in the salty water, then a slice given to each person at the table. Did everyone get a taste? Yes. All right. So perhaps the strangest item on the Passover table is this one called the Zoah, the shank bone of the lamb. And this represents the mighty arm of God that was used to deliver us from bondage and slavery in Egypt. It reminds us also of the blood of the lamb. Now, there are different traditions in the Jewish community about this. The tradition I grew up with the Ashkenazic Jews, which most Jewish people in the United States are Ashkenazic, um, is that the lambs, uh, lamb is no longer eaten at Passover in my tradition because the lambs that were eaten were the Passover sacrifices. And in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed, and so was the altar where the sacrifices were made. So, but, so therefore, from that time to this day, no lambs are eaten at, at Passover. It's more like a memorial to sacrifices which are no longer offered. But the presence of these two items, the zoah, the shank bone of the lamb, and then the egg that we call the chagigah, symbols of sacrifices which are no longer offered, poses a very interesting question. With no temple, with no altar, with no sacrifice, how is it possible to atone for our sin? Because the law of Moses in Leviticus 17.11 says it very clearly. For I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Oh, but maybe that blood stuff was relevant thousands of years ago, but come on. It's 2024. We don't need that blood stuff today, do we? Don't we? If not, then why does the book of Exodus, why does the Haggadah tell us that when we tell the story of Passover, we're supposed to say, this is because of what the Lord did for me when he brought me out of the land of Egypt, when he brought me out of bondage and slavery, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. I think we're supposed to tell the story of Passover personally because each one of us personally needs to be redeemed. But with no temple, with no altar, with no sacrifice, how is redemption possible? Well, once there lived a Jewish man, two th about 2,000 years ago, his name is Yochanan. You might know him better as John, John the Baptist. And one day while he was baptizing people in the Jordan River, he saw a man coming, and he said something very unusual about a man. In fact, uh, he was making a reference to Passover when he said this, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how. Not redemption, not through the sacrifice of Passover lambs year after year after year. Those were a shadow of things to come, but the substance was Christ. That was a, those were our tutor to lead us to Christ. The Lamb of God has come. His name is Jesus. That's who my Lamb of God is. The perfect, the once and for all sacrifice that all these sacrifices pointed to. My Lamb of God... Jesus. Now we come to the fourth question. On all other nights, we sit around dinner in any manner. But on Passover, we sit and we recline on pillows. Do you remember the passage I read? We're supposed to eat our, um, our, our meal with the, our robe fastened around our waist, our sandals on our feet, our staff in hand, ready to go in a moment's notice. 
well, tonight on, Pas on, on Passover nights, we eat reclining on pillows because that was before we were free. In ancient Middle Eastern societies, only the free can recline at dinner, only the redeemed. In Hebrew, we say, avadim hayinu, atav and necharim. Once we were slaves, now we are free. And if anyone has accepted Yeshua, Jesus, as their Messiah, he is free indeed. Free indeed. This is a redemption holiday. Now we come to the second cup, a cup of judgment or a cup of plagues. In Jewish tradition, um, a full cup represents complete joy, but in a sense, our joy is not complete. We pour out some of the contents of this cup as we remember the plagues that were poured out over the Egyptians. We mourn their loss. We express sorrow over their destruction. And the way we used to do this in my family, we'd take a napkin and we'd recite the plagues. And, and, e and with each plague, we'd take a drop of the grape juice and put it on the napkin, mourning their loss, even though they're our enemies. And so I would like for you to do this, uh, repeating after me, ready? And just take your pinky, a drop of grape juice, and put it on the napkin, ready? Blood. I can't hear you. Let's try it again. Blood. Frogs. Vermin. Wild beasts. Pestilence. Boils. Hail. Locusts. Darkness. Death of the firstborn. You know, there's an important lesson in this cup. Pharaoh defied the will of God. Pharaoh was repeatedly told what God wanted him to do. Yet Pharaoh said, no, I refuse, I will not. As a result of his hardness of heart, he brought death and destruction, not only upon his land, but into his own home. His son died because of his hardness of heart. So let me ask you, how often do we choose our own desires over God's direction. How often do we know what God wants us to do, but how often do we harden our hearts and say, no, I refuse, I will not. Let me give you a little piece of Jewish wisdom. If God is telling you to do something, do it. But, and let's all take a sip from the second cup, the cup of judgment or the cup of plagues. But Passover is a time of rejoicing. It's a, night, a time of celebration. It's a time to praise God. And on Passover, I could praise God not only because death passed over my ancestors' homes thousands of years ago, but because I've been redeemed from an even greater judgment through my faith in the Messiah of Israel, the Messiah Jesus. Through him, each one of us can pass over from death to life. And at this point, the meal is usually eaten and we're not going to have a big meal right now because I just wasn't sure if the church had a kosher kitchen or not. So instead, what we're going to do, sorry, this is, uh, is I want to share my testimony, how this Jewish guy from New York came to believe in Jesus, share a little bit about Chosen People Ministries and how you could partner with us if you like, and then we get to some very important things. I don't want you to miss it. The third cup, the fourth cup, and another cup, which uh, I'll have to tell you about later. So I don't want to miss that part. Well, I grew up in a conservative Jewish home in Long Island, New York. Remember, conservative is actually one of the branches of Judaism. It has nothing to do with politics. And the meaning of the word conservative in that, in that context is totally different. And um, so I grew up going to, I would walk to synagogue every week. I'd go to Hebrew school. I became a bar mitzvah at the age of 13, which is a Jewish rite of passage. And out of that experience, three very important beliefs were formed. One, there was a God. Two, the Hebrew scriptures, what you call the Old Testament, is holy. And three, that, uh, that there is a Messiah. Well, when I was nine, my parents divorced. And when I was 10, my father remarried. And when I was 12, I moved in from my mother's house to my father's house. And my uh, father and my stepmother were very Jewish, but they weren't very observant. They didn't go to synagogue on a regular basis. And so my beliefs in God just kind of got put off to the side. I stopped going to synagogue on a regular basis as well. And I got into some things that other teenagers in New York got into. I really don't want to talk a lot about that because I'm not here to glorify bad behavior. I'm here to glorify the Lord. 
So when I got to high school, 10th grade, um, my parents, my father and my stepmother wanted to give me this opportunity that my two older brothers had. My two older brothers went to a private college preparatory school, boarding school, and um, I think I live away from home at 10th grade. That sounds really cool. And uh, so fortunately, I did not get into the one that they went to. I didn't want to go to that one because it was all boys, and I don't think I need to explain why I didn't want to go to an all boys school as a 10th grader. Uh, but I wound up going to the, a school that you mentioned earlier, the Stony Brook School. It was a Christian school. But about three quarters of the students who go there, even to this day, are not Christians. It has excellence in academics, and it draws, um, it draws Jewish kids and Muslim kids and kids from all over the world, actually. It's an international school. I lived in a, in a dorm there. And I saw something, and, and that's part of the mission of the school, is to bring the gospel to Jewish kids like me, who wouldn't hear it otherwise. And it's the excellence in academics that draws us. But, I saw something in that school I never really saw before. I saw a group of students who called themselves Christians, really loving God, loving other people, and even people like me. And as a high school, I thought that was kind of weird uh, because the way I grew up, I grew up with a lot of anti-Semitism, and even from church people. I remember it was an elementary school. I was um, surrounded by some kids who said, uh, we learned in church yesterday that the Jews killed Jesus. You're a Christ killer. I didn't know what they're talking about. I didn't even meet the guy until years later. And, and, and it was, so if anyone at that time asked me if I wanted to become a Christian, I would have misunderstood the question severely. It wouldn't have made any sense to me. When I got to that school and I saw people that really loved each other, remember Jesus said, this is how all men will know you're my disciples, that you love one another. It made me think about my own need for God. So opening up his doors right near the school was an Orthodox Hasidic Lubavitch rabbi. What is that? I'm glad you asked. Uh, the Lubavitch movement, I'm sorry, I should have taped this down. Uh, the Lubavitch movement is a, you got a piece of tape? <laughs> He's ready. Is a uh, movement of ultra-Orthodox Judaism, you know, the people who wear the black and white outfit. Thank you. Perfect. All right, a movement of ultra-Orthodox Judaism that, that try to find Jewish people that are not ultra-Orthodox or not very religious and bring them into the fold of an ultra-Orthodox Jewish lifestyle. I was a Jewish kid going to a Christian school. You think this rabbi wanted to meet with me? Absolutely. So I started meeting with the rabbi. I was in walking distance from the school. I didn't have a car, so that was important. And I started learning a lot of things from the rabbi. We started studying Torah, a little bit of Talmud. I'd study and celebrate the Jewish holidays like Passover and others with him. But I was also learning some things at the Christian school that never occurred to me. I learned that Jesus was Jewish. I didn't know that. From the pictures, I thought he was Italian or Swedish or something. I didn't know. <laughs> I learned that he was born in Israel. I didn't know that either. I, you know, I learned later it was impossible. I, I, I thought maybe he was born in Rome or something like that. I didn't know. Uh, but I learned it was impossible for Jesus to be born in Washington, D.C. And that's because in Washington, D.C., there's just not enough wise men. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I learned that all of his disciples were Jewish and that he came to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then I learned he claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. That same Messiah I grew up hearing about in Hebrew school. Now, to make a claim like that, that takes a lot of chutzpah. That means guts uh, to, to make such a claim. And I thought, and somewhere along the line, I was exposed to a book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. And there's a chapter in that book, Liar, Lunatic, or Lord. And that made a lot of sense to me. Either he's a liar, lying, he's a nutcase, or he is who he says he is. Well, how would I find the answer to that? Well, I'd look in my side of the Bible, because it wouldn't start with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. I didn't realize that the whole time, that the whole thing was my side of the Bible. I didn't realize that at the time. So I got together with some of these Christians. We started looking at Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. And um, I'm thinking, my goodness, we're looking in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and even in the Psalms. And I'm thinking, this looks like it's talking about Jesus. One of the passages that really stood out to me was the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And I'm reading this chapter, and I'm thinking, this is amazing. So I, I, I go to the rabbi and say, Rabbi, look at this chapter, the 53rd of our own Hebrew prophet Isaiah, written 700 years before, Isaiah, before Jesus was even born, and it's describing him. The rabbi said, no, no, it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about Israel. 
I thought, well, you know, he's a rabbi, you should know. So I go back to the Bible study and I say, no, it's not talking about Jesus, it's talking about Israel. And we look closely. And as we look more closely at the passage, we saw Israel fit part of it, but not all of it. But Jesus fit all of it. And so I go back to the rabbi. I said, Rabbi, look what it says here. Uh, Israel fits this part, but doesn't fit this part, but Jesus fits all of it. And the rabbi said, I didn't say it was talking about Israel. I said, it could be talking about Israel. I don't know what it's talking about. I just know it's not talking about Jesus. So I went back to the Bible study and back to the rabbi and back to the, the over time, the rabbi thought I was totally lost. And the Bible study thought I was totally lost. And that's probably because I was totally lost. Well, almost, uh, after almost two years of searching, and I, I started thinking about it, and I thought, this is ridiculous. Jewish people don't believe in Jesus. What would my family think? Not good. That's called an understatement. What would my friends from back home think? And even the friends, remember, most of the students at the school weren't Christian. What would they think? Not good. Another understatement. And I started thinking about it, and I thought, maybe I need to be more concerned about what God thinks than what anyone else thinks. And I realized what I was doing. I was asking the rabbi about God and the Bible study about God and different people in my life about God. I never really asked God about God. So on May 3rd, 1981, about 10 a.m., but I don't keep track, I got down by myself alone in my dorm room. We lived in the dorm at the school. And I picked a verse in the old, that was both in the Old and the New Testament. The verse is, Seeking you shall find. And I said, God, I've been seeking for almost two years. Is Jesus the Messiah or not? And when I was totally open to God, no matter what the answer, I just knew that Jesus is the Messiah. And since I've been studying about him for almost two years, I, I knew what I needed to do. See, the prophet Isaiah says that there's none righteous, no, not one. In fact, Isaiah says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. In Hebrew, that's a euphemism for something even worse. Rabbi Shaul, who you know is the Apostle Paul, said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And later when I went to seminary and I studied New Testament Greek, I, I did a word study on the word all. I did the parsing and the exegesis and all that. Do you know what all actually means in the original Greek? It means all. <laughs> so I knew that meant me. And if you're here, that means you because you're part of all too. I need to repent and accept Jesus in my life as the Lord of my life, as my Savior, as my Messiah. And since that morning in the spring of 1981, when I did just that, I never felt more Jewish. Because what could be more Jewish than believing in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Than believing in the God of Moses and David and Jeremiah, the Jewish Messiah, Jesus? Well, God has done a lot in my life since then. I did graduate from the high school, in case you're wondering. I went on to become a clinical psychologist. I, I did seminary later. Um, and my wife was in the Air Force. She did 26 years in the Air Force. Uh, she's a retired colonel. And uh, so with the Air Force, every few years, we'd have to move. Uh, that's just the way Air Force works, and as a good military spouse. And so whenever we'd move, we'd always try to find a ministry that we can get involved with, and when possible, find a ministry that was involved in reaching my people with the good news of our Messiah, because the overwhelming majority of us do not yet believe in him. And so when we moved from Maryland to Virginia, uh, there wasn't a congregation that we had little kids, so we couldn't commute very far, uh, that, that we felt that we clicked with. And so I called my old congregation leader up in Maryland and to complain, and he said, you need to start something. I said, start something? I'm not qualified. I'm a psychologist. I'm not, you know. He goes, I know you're, you're not qualified, but you've ministered in my congregation for years, and I believe you're called. And God doesn't always call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. And so he connected me with a national leader in, in Jewish ministry who mentored me, took me under his wing, and, and I started a ministry which turned into a congregation. And while I'm doing that, uh, Chosen People Ministries is watching what I'm doing. And the president of Chosen People Ministries, I've known him since my college days. And uh, he pulled me aside and he, and he said, you need to join us. We want to pour our resources into you. We want to train you further and we need you to do this full time. But when he pulled me aside, he didn't come by himself. He brought with him the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
So I was vastly outnumbered at the time. <laughs> so I called my wife from the conference, and I said, hi, honey, how you doing? She said, great, how's the conference? She goes, wonderful, but there's something I need to talk to you about. I know it's 2010, and the economy is really bad, and I got a, and I got a great job making six figures, working for a big hospital, running two programs, loving what I'm doing, and we have kids in Christian school heading off to college soon, but I need to leave my job to join a support raise ministry in a bad economy. So I, I mean, if support raise ministry, for those of you who don't know, if you don't get paid to your fund within the ministry, not the general fund, but your fund within the ministry, you don't even get paid. I need to do this in a bad economy so I can work full time and reaching my people with the gospel. My wife's very smart, and she's also very good at math. So you know what she said, don't you? She said, it's about time you figured out that's what God was calling you to do. <laughs> Because God already spoke to her. We stepped out in faith, and, and we joined Chosen People Ministries. So what is Chosen, Chosen People Ministries? I'm glad you asked. We were founded in 1894 by an Orthodox rabbi who was searching for the Messiah. His name is Leopold Cohen. And he came to believe that, that the Messiah has come. And let's see the next slide. And our mission statement, Chosen People Ministries exist to pray for, evangelize, disciple, and serve Jewish people, and help others do the same. So what you see in those pictures is on the left is me sharing the gospel with a Jewish woman in the streets of New York City. On the right, I'm leading an evangelism team that, that I've trained and, and that we're heading to the streets of New York City. Next slide. Next slide. We're in 23 different countries across the globe. Next slide. We're throughout the United States. Next slide. And so what do I do? Well, I was in Virginia when I joined Chosen People Ministries. Then God called us to New York City, where I was the New York Regional Director. And then after a number of years in New York City, we have a great team that I left behind in place, wonderful people. And God called us to South Florida, where we live now. We followed the Jewish migration from New York and New Jersey to South Florida. And so the neighborhood I moved into is majority Jewish. And it's just wonderful, the gospel opportunities. I, I love it. So what do I do with Chosen People Ministries? Well, I do personal evangelism. I do street evangelism. Recently, our ministry led um, four teams on the streets uh, throughout Southeast Florida. 23 people prayed with us to receive the Lord on the streets. Two of them were Jewish. We share with Gentiles, too. Uh, we're an equal opportunity gospel ministry. Uh, <laughs> but we focus on, on Jewish people. And, um, and so... Uh, 23 prayed with us to receive the gospel on the streets. I'm just doing this so it doesn't lean over and fall on the box. I have a feeling, I'm hoping your pastor will invite me back, but if I burn down the church, he might not. <laughs> so I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to mitigate that. And so I do personal street evangelism. I lead Bible studies. I lead several Bible studies a week. I um, preach in congregations. You probably figured that part out. I, uh, I supervise mentor missionaries. I... I um, uh, I help churches reach the gospel with their Jewish neighbors, uh, Jew Jewish neighbors with the gospel. I teach um, at a seminary. I direct a ministry-wide wellness program and other stuff, too. I have lots of little projects that they, that they love to give me, I love to work on. Uh, if you want to support an underfunded missionary, I hope you'll consider me a candidate. Let me, let me tell you what the deal is. We go to the next slide. Uh, you can sign up to get our monthly prayer letter. I hope all of you got one of these brochures when you came in. If not, there'll be some at the table out there. Um, but fill this out. And if you hand in the front table, that means when you get our, our monthly prayer letter, you also get a newsletter. There, there are sample newsletters outside. Outside on the table, I have some books that are free side with the newsletters, but are not so free side with the books. And I think Judy will be out there to help you if you, want, if, if you want any uh, books, I hope that you won't make, lug me, make me lug all of those back to South Florida with me. Uh, but, uh, but there's also a QR code. If you want us to sign up for my prayer, prayer letter on the QR code. But if you do that, I ask you that when you get my prayer letter once a month, that you'll pray for the things on my letter. You'll also have an email on that, my email, so you can respond. And if you share prayer requests, I promise you, I will pray for you as well. If the QR code is hard, there's also a QR code on this. So feel free to rip this thing out 
you keep this, you can hand this back to Judy or in the offering plate afterwards, the church will get it to me. But if, if you do that, to thank you for praying for me, I want to give you a free Isaiah 53 explained book. If you want the book without signing up for my prayer letter list, they're $13. Your, your choice. <laughs> All right. So, and I hope that you'll consider either a one-time gift. If you write a check, make it out to Chosen People Ministries. My name in the memo, that's important. And um, I hope you'll, you'll consider if God is leading you either for monthly support. Some people give 25 or 50, 100 a month or more. I'm hoping someone will come along with $100,000 a month. It's not happened yet. If that happened, I promise you I will no longer be an under, underfunded missionary. <laughs> so, so let's get to the next stuff, all right? You had the meal. It was wonderful. Okay, just pretend you did. Uh, hopefully there's some spiritual food. And after the meal comes the third cup, the cup of redemption. But we can't partake, partake of this cup yet because something's missing. Earlier, something was broken, buried, and then brought back. It's this, and who remembers what that's called? The afikoman. Remember that piece of the matzotash, that middle piece of the matzotash called the afikoman? So all the search, children will search for the afikoman, but only one will find it. And so everyone who's 12 and under, the afikoman is somewhere around here, and carefully because I don't want you to knock over the cups with the juice, and I don't want you to knock over the candles. But come on up and find the afikoman. If you're 12 and under, you're welcome to come and take a search. Anyone want to look? Where could that afikoman be? It's somewhere up in the stage area. Well, take a look. You think it might be? Is it there? No, nope. those are luggage tags from my suitcase that I hid on the table. No, where could that off be coming? Remember that, it's in that white pouch. It's in that white little pouch. Now, I know you have honest kids, because if they were not looking at him back there, they would know. But you found it. Excellent. What's your, na what's your name? Harper. What's that? Harper. Harper. Harper found it. So after it's found, it's redeemed. It's brought back. And so what I'm going to do, Harper, is you can't give it back to me yet. You have to get it redeemed. How about that? Will that work? All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. Hope you had a little bit of fun doing this. And I'm back. Harper found the Afrikoman. So after it's found, it's redeemed. When I was a kid, it was a quarter. Uh, when my kids were younger, it was a dollar, just like I did. I don't know what, with inflation, I don't know what it is now. Maybe a Tesla? I have no idea. <laughs> I had my first grandchild. I told my son, start saving up for the Afikoman. <laughs> After it's redeemed, it's taken out of the pouch. Go ahead and take it out of the pouch. And it's broken again. And an olive-sized piece of the afikoman is taken along with the third cup, the cup of redemption. Does this look familiar to anyone? It should. This is the origins of our communion service. It came from a Passover Seder. But not only that, but where else can we find a clearer picture of our Messiah Jesus than this custom concerning the afikoman from, from, from which the uh, matzah was drawn. Do you remember this pouch, this matzah tosh, this mysterious pouch, this three-in-one? Well, there's quite a bit of disagreement among the rabbis about the meaning of this mysterious three-in-one. The matzah is taken from that, but if you think about it, where else can you find a clearer picture of our Messiah Jesus and this matzah. Even the matzah, which is pierced to make sure it does not become leaven, speaks of Jesus, a symbol of a sinless life. In ancient times, matzah was pierced to make pictures of birds or fish or flowers. But I believe another picture could be seen in this matzah. I believe Jesus could be seen in this matzah symbolically. 
as the prophet Zechariah foretold, if we go to the scripture. And I will pour out upon the house of David and the, on the, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of pleading so that they will look at me whom they have pierced. Look at the matzah. Can you see how it's pierced? And mourn for him like one mourning for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him, like one weeping over a firstborn. When was God pierced? At Calvary. He was pierced at Calvary. And we'll, we'll do this together later, but I just, in just a few minutes, but it was taking the matzah, taking the unleavened bread, that Jesus said, this is my body broken for you and you and you and all of us. Do this in remembrance of me. We have a slide for that. Um, we have a slide for that. One more. Oh, okay, we don't have a slide for that just yet. We'll have one later. My bad. <laughs> all right. But do you remember... This, this masatash that you all, all of you have, and, and the head of the household, just grab the masatash so you can hold it. There's quite a bit of disagreement among the meaning of the, of the masatash. Some say it represents the, um, the three layers of masatash, each one separated by some cloth, the three divisions of worship in the ancient kingdom. In fact, this masatash says Levi, the Levites, Yisrael, and then the third one says Kohen, Kohen. Uh, the Levites, the priests, and the people of Israel. Well, maybe it represents that, but why is the middle monster broken, buried, and then brought back? Well, some rabbis say, no, no, no. The three patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why is the middle monster broken, buried, and then brought back? And there's so many different competing explanations, and the origins of this tradition have been lost, and that's why nobody really knows. But there's another explanation that has its roots in the first century. There are three layers here, each one separated by some cloth. And these three layers form a unity. In biblical Hebrew, a word which may mean such a unity, complex or compound uh, unity, is the word echad, which brings to mind the words of God given through Moses in Deuteronomy 6.4 when he said, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Here, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. But the word used for one there is echad. And in biblical Hebrew, it can mean a compound or a complex unity. Uh, the two shall become echad flesh, just as an, as an example of that. This reminds me of another scripture. See, there's, two, there's three layers here. The middle one is taken out. It becomes visible, while the other two remain hidden from view. And from the Gospel of John, we say, in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We Jews who know the Messiah know also that, believe also that the unity of the Masatash bears witness of the unity of the one God revealed in three persons. Let's say it with me. Ready? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Why is the middle monster broken, buried, and then brought back? I think it was because Jesus was broken, buried, and then brought back. This, and taking the monster, he said this. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now time for the third cup, the cup of redemption. In Jewish tradition, uh, the, this third cup, the fruit of the vine is usually red. And this is to remind us of that precious blood of that Passover lamb, that first Passover lamb that was sacrificed so that we might be redeemed, that we might be brought back from bondage and slavery to, to Pharaoh. In the same way, Another Passover lamb, the Messiah Jesus, was sacrificed so that we might be redeemed. We might be brought back from bondage and slavery to sin. 
It was concerning this cup, the cup taken after dinner, that a Messiah Jesus said this, this cup which is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, remembrance of me. Does that language sound familiar? That when it says a new covenant, I, talk, I remember sharing once with an Orthodox Jewish man, and he said, new covenant, there's no new covenant in my Bible. What are you talking about? I opened the, we opened the Bible to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, which says this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. This is the prophet Jeremiah. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made uh, with their fathers in the day I took them out of the land of Egypt, uh, to bring them under the... Oh, my eyes, I need, I need better vision here. My father's day, I took them, out of the, took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. The cup of redemption the third cup, is taken together with the broken piece of matzah in remembrance of the blood and body of the Passover lamb. My Passover lamb is Jesus. And it, since it was during the Passover Seder, why don't we uh, take communion together? Because this is where the communion comes from. But before we do that, Paul gives very specific instructions in 1 Corinthians in the 11th chapter. Paul says this, uh, and we don't have a slide for this. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must examine himself, and in doing so is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not properly recognize the body. So before we do this, I want, we're going to take a moment of silence where we can examine ourselves. But if you have not yet received Jesus as the Lord of your life and as your Savior, I'm going to ask that you just refrain from this part. No one's going to be judging you or watching you or anything like that. But just let the cup and, and let the matzah pass. Um, well, let's take a moment. But by the way, if you do not yet believe in him, but would like to receive him right now, what's stopping you? You could do that. And your very first act as a new believer could be communion with him. And so if you don't yet know him, but want to believe in him, want to receive him into your heart, because one day death is going to be passing all of us. And he's going to be looking at the lintel and the doorpost of our hearts. And he's going to be looking for the blood of that slain perfect lamb. And if it's there, he will force death to pass over. Let's pray. Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king. Lord, if there's anyone here who's not yet received you as the Lord of their lives, as their savior, as their messiah, I ask, Lord, that, you, uh, that today may be the day of their salvation. Even right now, Lord, I, I ask that they say this prayer to themselves or out loud. It's up to them. Lord Jesus, you are Lord of lords. You are King of kings. And I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And I, and I repent and I ask your forgiveness. And I want to receive you in my heart as the Lord of my life, as my Savior, as my Messiah. And I want to follow you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. So regarding the Lord's Supper, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, when he had given thanks, I want you to repeat after me because this is probably what he said. This is ancient prayers. Baruch atah Adonai. Eloheinu melech. 
העולם. המוציא לחם מן הארץ. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He'd given thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So everyone take a piece of that afikomen. Break about an olive-sized piece and partake. If you can't find the afikomen, Go ahead and, and just take another piece of matzah. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. Remember, I said this is the third cup, the cup taken after dinner. Saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Go ahead and drink from the third cup. Remember, the cup of redemption and the broken piece of matzah are taken together in remembrance of the blood and body of the Passover lamb. My lamb is Jesus. We now come to the fourth cup, the cup of Hallel. All of you know a Hebrew word, but I don't know if you know it's Hebrew or not. The word is hallelujah, and it means praise the Lord. The first part of the wor word is Hallel, which means praise. What a time to praise the Lord, amen? amen. After the redemption that we have here. But there's one last cup. Oh, so go ahead and take another sip for the fourth cup. But there's one last cup which I haven't told you about yet. A cup from which no one drinks. This is the cup of Elijah. In fact, in many Jewish homes, most Jewish homes at Passover, an entire place setting is all left empty, all for the prophet Elijah. And it's tradition. Now you may be wondering why this lying in the middle of a Passover table for the prophet Elijah. Well, it's recorded by the Hebrew prophet Malachi. No, it's not by the Italian prophet Malachi. I don't know who that is. It's according to the Hebrew prophet Malachi that before the Messiah returns, he will be preceded by Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. So during the Passover, it's tradition for the youngest child, that was me, to go to the door, open it wide, hoping Elijah will accept the invitation, come in, got a pillow for him, sit down, dine with them, drink with them, and announce the coming of Messiah. At this point, one of the ancient, oldest Hebrew melodies is sung, a song called Eliyahu Hanavi, which means Elijah the prophet. And it goes like this. Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hagiladi, Bimhera Viyamenu, Yavo Elehinu, Imoshiach ben David, Imoshiach ben David. Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the Gileadite, even so, come soon, and with you bring Messiah. Son of David. Well, I know Elijah has returned. Because when Jesus spoke of the prophet John, John the Baptist, he said, of him, he said this of him. If we go to the next slide. Uh, he said, if you care to accept it, speaking of John the Baptist, if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. The prophet, the forerunner has come. And so has the Messiah Jesus. If we go to the next slide. Paul said that when we eat this bread and drink this cup, as for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even so, come Lord Jesus. There's about 15 million Jewish people in the world. 
about five and a half million in the United States, about six and a half million in Israel. The overwhelming majority of us does not yet believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why I left my job as a psychologist to go in full time into missions. May we be faithful to proclaim his death. And that in his death, he took upon our sin and our shame in his own body. The same one prophesied in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah when he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity, the sin of us all, to fall on him. That's 700 years Isaiah wrote that before Messiah was born. May we be faithful to proclaim his death. May we be faithful to proclaim his resurrection on the third day. May we be faithful that, that when we, to proclaim that when we believe in him, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we, may we also be faithful to proclaim his soon return. Because he's coming back soon. I don't know when that is. I'm, I'm not a prophet. I even work for a nonprofit organization. But, but, but I know that he's coming back soon. And may we be faithful. May we live like believers. May we live like a redeemed people. Does anyone here who's not yet received them? Remember, today can be the day of your salvation. Because he's coming back. He's coming back soon. No one knows the day of the hour. And soon could be in the next five minutes. And soon could be 10 years from now. I don't know. But if you want to meet a nice little Jewish boy whose mother thought he walked on water, uh, he did. He actually did walk on water. Talk to your pastor. Talk to me. Talk to the person who brought you. We would love to make that introduction for you. And I know the pastor will have some resources for you regarding that. Let's pray. Avina Makenu, our father, our king, we thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We thank you that while we were dead in our trespasses and sin, we thank you while there was nothing that we could have done, that you did it, Lord. That you demonstrated your own love towards us. That while we were yet sinners, while we were in active rebellion against you, you loved us. You paid the penalty for our sin. And that you want to spend eternity with us. And we pray these things. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach Mishikenu, name of Jesus the Messiah, our Messiah. Amen. What a wonderful morning we've had with uh, Dr. Hertz. Uh, My heart's been touched numerous times through this uh, Seder together. Thank you for coming and participating with us. And may this week be a time where we're preparing our hearts, remembering what Christ has done for us. Come back on Good Friday. We'll have a service. Uh, You can take the journey towards the cross, uh, going to six different stations. And then come celebrate with us next Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But today, if you've appreciated what the Lord has taught you or encouraged your heart with uh, because of the Messianic Rabbi, Dr. Mike Hertz. Would you just give him a round of applause and give him appreciation? Thanks. Thank you so much, Mike. And there are buckets, I believe, were turned, returned to each table, I think. Uh, and you can take those buckets. Any offerings that are given at this time uh, will go to Uh, Chosen People Ministry, or directly to Dr. Hertz. So uh, we'll collect those. But uh, before we leave this place, I would love for the rabbi to pray over us a blessing uh, taken from the scriptures, God's word. Dr. Hertz? I like to do a traditional Hebrew blessing. For I know we discussed this. I'm sorry. It's been a long morning. I don't remember. Did we discuss, was I going to do the Hebrew, or were you going to do the Hebrew? I uh, couldn't remember what we decided. I, uh, the Hebrew? Yeah, would it be okay if I did the Hebrew this time? Would you mind? I, I think that was the arrangement. And would you be willing to translate for me? I'll, I'll translate You'll it for translate you. Yeah. For me. All right, this is an ancient Hebrew blessing. 
I know that Jesus would have been aware of this because he divinely inspired it from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. And would you please, or would you please rise? Yivarecha Kadonai Vaishma Recha Ya Eradonai Pana Velecha Vichunecha Isahadonai Pana Velecha Vyasehem Lecha Shalom Amen. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord be gracious over you, and may his, may his countenance shine above you, show his favor to you, and may his peace go with you now until we meet again. God bless you. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. Join us again next week and invite a friend. If you'd like to support or just know more about us, visit our website at www.westwoodchurch.com, www.westwoodchurch.com, or email us at office at westwoodchurch.com. Have a wonderful week, and now go and be the church.